All right, I might start introductions to everybody who's on the call so far at the moment. Um, everyone who's online, so welcome to the second Drug and Alcohol Research and Innovation Active Learning session, DARIA for short. For those who didn't attend last week, that was our first session with Dr. Krista Seyfried presenting on methamphetamine use disorder. Um, Today, we've got Dr. Christopher Tremonti, who is a staff specialist at St. Vincent's Hospital, Sydney, um, an addiction specialist who will be presenting on methadone to buprenorphine transfers, um, also covering microdosing as well. Uh, just some housekeeping for the session. So there's a chat and a Q&A function, which you should all be able to see down the bottom of the screen. Um, if you've got, we'll have question time at the end of the session. Um, but if you think of questions throughout the session that you want to be asked later, pop those in the Q&A box so that Chris then can then go through them at the end um, and be able to easily track where those questions are. If you've got any kind of tech issues or just want to make sort of comments or anything, then just use the chat function um, and we can address any problems that come up in that as well. Um, in the question section at the end as well, there's also a raise hand function if you want to actually talk um, and to ask your question and to actually speak and discuss. Um, you're also free to put questions in the question answer box at that time as well. Um, but yeah, if you press the raise hand function at the end during the question time, then our admin, our direct admin will be able to unmute you so you can have a discussion and ask that question. Um, through the microphone as well. But at the moment, all uh, participants are muted except for the, um, the presenting panelists. Um, if there are no other things that we need to cover, which I don't think there are, I suppose we'll get started and I'll let Dr. Chris Tremonti introduce himself. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, and thanks everybody for coming along. Uh, originally, I had met, uh, planned to present on microdosing, and I will talk a little bit about it, but I think this is probably, um, it's only a slight pivot to talk about methadone to buprenorphine transfers. And yes, I am one of the staff specialists at St. Vincent's. I am just, I am an addiction specialist, but I'm also a clinical pharmacologist. So hence uh, my interest in the pharmacology, which I appreciate we have a wide variety of people in the audience. So I don't wanna get too bogged down in that today, but I think obviously we need to, to talk about that. and. I've already been asked the question of why I have this particular dog here. Lucy actually knew the breed of dog. Um, perhaps a few other people in the audience do as well. So we'll, that will be explained later. So today we'll just talk about the background to, to methadone to buprenorphine transfers. Um, we'll have a look at the current guidelines because there are a few around. We'll have a look at a little bit around the literature uh, and some of the different methods that people are using now to transfer people between methadone and buprenorphine. Um, and looking ahead, which is basically me patting myself on the back for my own research. Um, so I don't think there'd be anybody in the audience that isn't aware that um, methadone and buprenorphine are both first-line treatments for opioid dependence. Um, they are both first-line. There's not one is not preferred over the other. They are both uh, good choices. Um, methadone does have some evidence behind it, and it has better retreat, uh, better retention levels than buprenorphine, um, but buprenorphine perhaps has the benefit in its safety profile. Uh, it's got a ceiling effect, it's less sedating, and it, there's also a little less stigma. A lot of people don't know what buprenorphine is, so to tell someone I'm taking you versus I'm taking methadone, uh, most people know what the latter is. And of course, um, now we've got the buprenorphine depot, which means increased flexibility for patients, once a week or once a month injections. So what's the problem? So the main issue is the pharmacology, which is complicated. Um, so just to give you some idea, I've, I've listed four opioids here. So morphine, codeine, methadone, methadone and buprenorphine. And as you can see, morphine and codeine, I've, I put codeine in there just to give uh, a bit of equivalency uh, to morphine because it has some as opposed to the other two. Codeine has quite a short half-life. Uh, so this is one of the reasons we don't use it for opioid treatment programs. Um, its potency is lower than morphine, so morphine will displace it from opioid receptors. Um, and the equivalence, it's about, it's about 80, uh, it's probably more close to 60, um, but somewhere between 60 and 80 of codeine to morphine in terms of uh, an equivalency. Methadone, on the other hand, uh, has a very long half-life, as does buprenorphine. Methadone has a similar potency to morphine, um, and uh, there's no accepted equivalence for methadone to morphine. 
Similar with buprenorphine, uh, it's got a very long half-life, its potency is greater than that of morphine. Um, and again, there's no widely, you know, widely accepted conversion to morphine, to the buprenorphine, in part because of its action as a partial agonist, which I'll explain in a moment. Apologies to those of you who are aware of all of this. I, I think it is important just to cover this, cover this though at the same time. So potency is the amount of drug it takes to get an effect, which is different to efficacy, which is the amount of effect the drug can generate. So those are two different things. Even though they seem and sound kind of similar, potency is the amount. So if, um, so in, if we look at the pharmacology of methadone and buprenorphine, um, you can see that in this example, that methadone is drug A, and buprenorphine is drug B. So it takes less methadone, uh, sorry, buprenorphine to get that initial effect, but then it has a ceiling effect and its efficacy only gets to about 50% versus methadone, which whilst there is a slight curve upwards to the, the top here, uh, continues to have an effect um, greater and greater as you keep adding additional drug on. There's no ceiling on how much we methadone we can give to the point where obviously we can kill someone. We can kill people with buprenorphine as well, but it's much easier with methadone. So what happens with precipitated withdrawal? So we've got receptors full of lovely yellow methadone. Uh, the buprenorphine comes along, uh, displaces the methadone out of the receptor, the opioid receptors. And because it's got not as great an effect, uh, it therefore means that people feel like they're going into withdrawal. Um, and that happens very quickly because uh, buprenorphine does work very quickly and displaces all of those receptors. So patients report feeling quite, quite awful. Uh, and for those of you who are working on the wards at the moment, we've actually just recently admitted somebody who was attempting their own outpatient transfer from 80 milligrams of methadone and took some uh, illicit uh, buprenorphine, 24 milligrams, and of course went straight into precipitated withdrawal. So methadone, so the, the important take home points out of all of that, methadone, full agonist, uh, it's got um, a very high efficacy, its potency is about average to that of morphine, it's got a very long half-life variable metabolism. Buprenorphine, it's got an average efficacy, so it, it's, it, only, it only gets to about 50%. Its potency, however, is very high uh, in that it will knock other opioids off the receptor. It's got a very long half-life um, and variable metabolism. So therefore, the transition from methadone to buprenorphine has precipitated withdrawal, and, and as a consequence, patients are, are anxious about it, and clinicians sometimes are a bit nervous about it too. So just moving on to the guidelines, these are the current New South Wales Health uh, Treatment of Opioid Dependence Guidelines. And this is straight out of, out of there. So basically the, the guidance at the moment is to try and get patients onto as low a dose as possible of methadone without destabilizing them. So uh, there are a lot of patients who do want to transfer over who um, for you know, perhaps because of their own preconceived ideas or whatever else, and sometimes do so perhaps when they're not stable. And I still do encourage patients that they need to be on a stable dose of methadone where, uh, where possible. Um, some patients are scared of going up on dilated doses of methadone because they don't think they'll won't be able to come off it uh, and they haven't got options. But as I'm going to explain today, there are actually options for this. So I did want to emphasize that point. But at the moment, so this is for patients, they've been on methadone for some time. They're not using uh, injectable or, or smoke heroin anymore. They're stable and and um, they're at a point where they they feel comfortable and they can come down. So we bring them down as much as we can. We review them. We manage their expectations around this. We explain look, there's a you know a chance that you have some withdrawal and all of that. We wait 24 hours after their last dose of methadone, and then we wait for every four. We review them every four to eight hours. Um, we commence buprenorphine when their cows is um, uh, over greater than 13, which is consistent with a moderate withdrawal, which is actually decent. You've got to have some reasonable signs of, of uh, opioid withdrawal going at that point. We give them a two milligram test dose and then we give them another six milligrams after that. We can then give them some supplementary doses and really we should be getting patients up as quickly as possible on the first day to get them comfortable. If you can tolerate 60 of methadone, you can probably tolerate 32 of, of, of buprenorphine as well. Um, and then, you know, there's some guidance around how much to give them each day after that as well, and utilising some delayed medications too. This is Queensland. Um, so they recommend trying to get patients on to 40 or less for at least one week. And I should point out um, in New South Wales, it's not, it's not scripted, but there is some suggestion we should have patients on less than 60. 
um, and um, in, in order to do this as an outpatient. And um, if anybody is above that level, we try and get them admitted to do this. Um, and again, the, the Queensland guidelines, you know, we really want to see patients in, in a, with objective opioid withdrawal symptoms. So it's not enough for them to say, oh, I feel like I'm hanging out. You want to be able to see dilated pupils, see some sweating, see some uh, pilo erection and so forth, um, so that you don't, um, you don't worsen the situation. Uh, this is um, a, a, from the same guidelines, so just giving some guidance around sort of how much to, to give initially and then what to put them on after that. Uh, and again, as mentioned, for everything than 40, uh, this is the Queensland ones, then you know, this, is, this is what to, to you know, what to do basically, to, put, to do them um, you know, uh, as an inpatient. Uh, this is uh, in the UK. Oh, sorry, correction, that, that was in the UK, the one I just showed you a moment ago, my apologies. And just to give you some uh, heads up, uh, with Bouvardale, the, the buprenorphine depot is coming out. They actually are now, it's actually now written in the PGA um, product information that you can go straight from uh, methadone to buprenorphine, but you need to wait 24 hours and be on a dose of around 30 milligrams uh, before you do this. I will say I have done this a couple of times and I've, I've don't think it's been a, just from personal experience, I don't feel like it's been a great transition. Perhaps I'm biased for reasons you'll see in a moment. So what can we do for patients who are on high doses? Uh, so this is a little quick look at the literature around that. And there's a few papers, and I want to focus on the bottom two in particular because they're both Sydney-centric. So that's uh, Nick Linceris's paper uh, from a couple of years ago, and then Alicia Foran's paper, which I was involved with. From, which I don't believe is published, is due for publication. I don't believe you can actually get it online, but I can give you the results of that if anyone's involved in that. Um, so just looking at, sorry, just quickly before I go on to those. Um, so, the, you know, as you can see here, the numbers are reasonably limited in what people have published. Um, you know, um, you know, no more than sort of a, in between the first four, um, excluding the two Sydney studies, you know, there's not really, there's, there's only around sort of, sort of 60 kind of cases that have been presented here. Um, and the success rates, though, are reasonable per, for across the board, you know, looking at, you know, over, you know, sort of at least 80% for most of them. Just looking at, um, at Nick Linceris's study uh, from a couple of years ago, Look, this was in part a study that was looking at uh, how much people were obeying the guidelines around this as well. So it was a kind of interesting study from that point of view. The guidelines are there and yet we're often not obeying them ourselves. And probably in particular, where we're probably perhaps pulling the trigger a little bit early um, on when patients um, get their buprenorphine because the patients start to feel anxious and perhaps we're not managing those symptoms as well as we can. Nonetheless, um, he had low dose, medium dose, and high dose. So it was, I think, low dose, uh, I believe it was 30 to 50, less than 30, 30 to 50, and greater than 50. Um, and the majority um, were successful. The only cases of precipitated withdrawal were in those in the high dose, so greater than 50. And the majority, which uh, were a success, which was basically whether or not they're on buprenorphine a week after the transfer. So that was, that's pretty pleasing. Um, and this is this was their dosing that they had um, during the um, during the sort of lead up to being on the treatment. Uh, so you can see there the 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 low dose people are the green circles, and most you know, sort of sitting around sort of the twenty milligram mark. Then there's the um, the patients who are on the, the moderate doses, so around sort of forty to fifty, and then the patients who are on high dose. So getting up there, so getting. This is this is an average dose, so um, so patients with an average dose of, of eighty or higher, so reasonably reasonably high doses um, in terms of doing the transfer. He also um, did some methadone troughs um, and looked at their cow scores, um, which maybe had a small, very small, subtle correlation there. But um, the higher your methadone trough. Uh, the higher your cow score, but not um, it wasn't it wasn't amazing. Um, and the two that are circled are the two patients. Uh, two, so he didn't get he, they didn't do methadone trots on all of them, even though there were more than two patients who had precipitated withdrawal. Um, so one of the patients had a very 
you know, had a decent methadone trough, the other one didn't. So the, it's a bit unusual what happened with that, that circle down towards the 100 um, nanograms per mil mark as opposed to the other one, which was probably pretty obvious as to why they got some precipitated withdrawal. Um, so I will talk about the forum paper, but I'll do that as a way of sort of talking a little bit about morphine bridging and sort of introducing some of the other methods that people use to switch people over to from, from methadone to, to buprenorphine. So morphine bridging is basically, you know, we cease the patient that's on, on methadone, we commence a short acting opioid, usually morphine, um, in an equinumerary amount to, um, to the methadone. So what I mean by that, um, as I say, it's, it's no real hard and fast uh, equivalency for morphine and methadone but um, to, we can feel comfortable that giving them sort of 60 morphine of QID orally, they'll tolerate reasonably well. And there's no, you know, we're not gonna over sedate them or anything like that. If anything, potentially we might even be underdoing them a little bit. So this is what, you know, this is part of one of the protocols we've got at, um, at St. Vincent's Hospital for doing that. Um, and, you know, the obvious caveat here is that um, patients usually need to come into hospital because we don't want to give patients lots and lots of morphine to, to go out on and um, you know, potentially have complications with. This was one paper around morphine bridging, which was actually a bit of a bomb, um, basically. But I mean, there was a lot going on here. These were uh, pregnant women uh, who were on methadone. I don't know why they wanted to bring, take them over to buprenorphine in the context of being pregnant. They all failed. Um, it wasn't particularly, wasn't particularly good, um, a good outcome for these women. Um, one had withdrawal, yeah, two of them just didn't like being on bup, and one had nausea and concerns about you know, hepatitis or, or gallbladder disease. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say they had precipitated withdrawal or any complications like that, but I'm just not sure why they wanted to do that in the, um, in the, in the setting of being pregnant. So this is the paper that I'm, I'm involved with, or was involved with, um, have written, submitted, and had published. Um, and was, this was really a retrospective case series um, that, but there was um, quite, it was an opportunity to have a look at uh, bridging because there was a relatively even split between patients who were bridged and patients who weren't. So, as I mentioned, it was really just an audit of about five years worth of uh, transfers from methadone to buprenorphine. Uh, so there were 71 cases in total. And then, uh, as I say, we, we had a look at a few things. So morphine bridging versus non-bridging. Um, and again, we've used this equinumerary uh, method. So 90 milligrams of methadone is 90 milligrams morphine per day. And then we uh, compared, we did a little bit of analysis around high dose versus low dose transfers as well with a cutoff of 40 milligrams being the definition of, of high dose. And again, this, this varies from paper to paper as what people consider high dose in the, in the transfer world. So just in terms of, just as, just as a comparator, uh, there were 34 people who were bridged and 37 who weren't bridged, um, reasonably similar rates of, of other substance use, time on methadone perhaps, um, and um, you know, male and so forth. Uh, in terms of outcomes, um, so the, the success rate between the two arms was, well, not that they were arms, this is, as I say, this is a retrospective audit, but the two, the success between the two arms was similar. Time to first dose was a lot longer and those were bridged. And that's because typically the protocol itself kind of mandates that there's got to be some time there that they are on morphine um, while the methadone is washing out of their system. So typically um, places, um, centres will do a three day bridging course. So that's at least 72 hours there. So that's longer than the non-bridged people, um, as you can see. Uh, cows was a bit higher in those who were bridged. And again, that might be just a reflection of the, the time, you know, the time they had uh, as off methadone. Um, but otherwise, yeah, there wasn't any, anything that was too, um, too dissimilar between the two, two groups in all honesty.
just to go through reasons why patients so um, did fail. Um, some of them didn't even, just to point out, some of them didn't even really dose. So half of them didn't actually even get the dose. So we can't really blame the group for that. Um, and sometimes, as we know, patients are discharged, you know, will self-discharge because they changed their mind. That's fine. Sometimes there's disciplinary factors and so forth. So that's part of the seven that, that are there. Um, some of them just decided they want to come off treatment entirely, and one of them decided they just want to do an outpatient, so they do it as an outpatient. Um, there was two cases of documented precipitated withdrawal. Um, there was uh, a few patients who just decided to relate to methadone, and that might be because of efficacy and whether or not they felt it was treating them. Uh, and there was one patient who went into urinary retention on, on buprenorphine, which was um, which was interesting as well. Um, so just to just to give you some idea about sort of time to first dose and methadone dose, really no correlation whatsoever. So uh, the amount of time waited until patients got their first dose. Similarly, their length of stay, absolutely no correlation between that and their methadone dose. Um, oh, there was a sorry, I'll show you this quickly as well. Sorry, I've had these slides out of order. Um, and there's really really no, I know it looks like there's a nice line there, but that's a pretty weak correlation between the dose of methadone and admission and their, their buprenorphine dose of discharge. So again, just kind of highlighting how complicated the, the pharmacokinetics of all of these drugs are um, and that we don't really, you know, as I say, like just because a patient's on one particular dose of, of methadone when they come in doesn't necessarily tell you what their discharge buprenorphine dose is going to be. Just to compare the highs and lows, um, interestingly, um, there were, uh, the, well, the high dose were actually, well, the numbers were more successful, but uh, it wasn't borne out in, in sort of statistical analysis that there was particularly significant. Uh, the perhaps patients ended up on a slightly higher dose, but really, as, as demonstrated um, on the, the next slide, there's really little to indicate what sort of dose a patient will go home on. And you know, the, pay, the, do, the doses that patients were on was decent, you know, an average dose of 92 milligrams. It's the, we're getting up there in terms of dose. Just to put, you know, to stop patting myself on the back for a moment for all my hard work in that paper, um, we there just to look at some other people who are even more narcissistic than myself. Uh, this guy has come up with the Azar method, which uh, is named after himself. Um, Poirier Azar, um, who basically used a fentanyl patch um, to switch someone over. Um, never done it. Don't see why I would and don't will. But nonetheless, it's worthwhile to, to, to point out all of the, uh, the different ways that, uh, that we, we can do these sorts of things in the community. Um, this was a, um, a yeah a very novel approach, Vanessa Urban, um, using buprenorphine rescue from naltrexone-induced opioid withdrawal uh, during a relatively rapid detox from high-dose methadone. So basically, they had some patients on, uh, on methadone. They gave them 25 milligrams of naltrexone. Lo and behold, they all went into withdrawal. And then they gave them buprenorphine straight away. Um, so typically within the, within the hour. Um, not going to recommend that one either. Just thought you should all be aware that that's there. Um, so then this was a, this, so this is where the microdosing aspect of it comes into it. So the, uh, the dog that was on there earlier is a, um, a Bernese Mountain Terrier, I believe it is. Lucy can correct me on that one. And the, so microdosing is also known as the Bernese method, in part because it was invented in Bern by some uh, Swiss uh, physicians. And so basically this paper was a systematic review of using microdosing for buprenorphine induction. Now, that wasn't specifically for methadone, that was for any use coming from any opioids, so heroin, morphine, oxycodone, whatever. So, Microdosing has received a lot of interest um, as a way to get people onto buprenorphine. I'm not going to talk about using microdosing as a way to get people onto buprenorphine from heroin or other opioids because, um, well, I, I, I'm just not going to talk about that. Don't have time. But I guess also 
I don't personally think that there's anything too wrong with how things are in that world at the moment, but, but certainly the addiction world is very, um, you know, excited about microdosing. And, you know, I guess if you've got, if you've got the patient who feels they can't stop using heroin, then perhaps this is a way to, to switch them over um, and sorry, to get them initiated into treatment. But um, I think its role, personally, for me, outside of switching somebody from a long acting opioid is perhaps limited. But that's a personal bias, and I'll let you do your own research around that. So this is um, this is the this as I say, this was a paper looking at inductions from a range of opioids. So as mentioned, this is the, the cute little doggy. It's uh, the Bernese Mount, Bernese Mountain Terrier, I think, something. Very cute. Um, and uh, yes, there's, there's the Swiss um, physicians that are involved in sort of using, you know, sort of starting out this microdosing technique. So then there's six um, different papers that have presented um, basically uh, eight or nine different um, cases of using microdosing for methadone to be penorphine transfers within this paper. So the paper itself had about 30. 30 cases, but not, as I say, only about nine of them were, 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 were transfers. Um, from, from you. So of the ones I could find, I couldn't find one of them. So there, were, there was a nine, um, but uh, all eight were successful, which is good. Uh, two of them had precipitated withdrawal, um, and they were on doses from around anywhere between 18 to 140. The 140, as we'll talk about in a moment, has a little bit of an asterisk on it. Um, they typically took around seven days. Um, to, while they were on the methadone. And this, something else I should point out is that there was a very big range of not just the way the patients were initiated on their buprenorphine, but also in how the methadone was titrated off. So you could just stop it, you could, you could drop it down slowly, you could halve it. There's all sorts of different techniques that people were using in these things, as we'll go through in a moment. And again, yep, buprenorphine doses vary. So could maybe patients were starting at a milligram or two milligrams or whatever else. So. So just to give you some idea, this was um, uh, one, one that used buprenorphine, oxycodone, and methadone. So I really hope I don't confuse the issue with a third, um, a third uh, opioid, but nonetheless, they had sort of oxycodone in there for sort of symptom management as they were going through this process. Um, and they were, yeah, this was only a, this was a patient on, um, on only on 18 milligrams, so not a, not a huge dose to begin with. Don't know why 18. I'm assuming they've rounded up from 17.5. Um, this is a patient who was on 75 who got started on a patch, and then the patch got made to bup. Um, and, and funnily enough, they're all using naloxone. I don't know necessarily why they're using the bup with naloxone. Nonetheless, they are, um, and then. Um, slowly titrating that up um, over the course of you know, sort of around 12 days. So reasonably slow, not less. Then this was another one, the patient on 25, and they chipped away at it by five milligrams a day, and then put the bup up by sort of, sort of almost, you know, sort of going up by a couple of milligrams each day. Again, similar to the previous one, this was the same study. Um, and then this is one where they just basically, again, titrate it up and just on stop it with the methadone. So as you can see, there's, there's all sorts of different techniques. Um, and another one, 40 milligrams, and they've gone up by about, um, by, by a couple of milligrams over the course of a week or so. Don't want to linger on these too long, because obviously you know, there's lots and lots of different ways of doing this. The most interesting was this chap who was a 34 year old who had prolonged QT, who'd come in with aggressive behaviors. They wanted to start another QT prolonging drug, I believe, as yeah, Zucloak and Pixel. Uh, and they were on 200 of methadone. They dropped them down to 180 and then they dropped them to one, uh, basically 140 given as a split dose and then did the transfer. So I don't know how, I can't be confident how quick it was. That's a, that's a huge, huge drop. Um, and they started them on a patch um, and then dropped it to once daily uh, methadone. Um, funnily enough, he did have some precipitated control. <laughs> um, I don't know how they managed his, his agitation and everything else. I'm assuming this happened uh, in the confines of a psychiatric unit given his aggressive behaviours. And I don't know how comfortable I feel doing this sort of in a less controlled environment. And perhaps he sort of didn't have a lot of choice uh, over his treatment. It sounds a bit brutal to me. 
So the last stop I'll make on this magical mystery tour is to do some more self-promotion. Um, so this is my trial. Um, so this is um, microdosing with buprenorphine to transfer from methadone to buprenorphine, really sexy title, uh, a prospective non-randomized open label clinical trial. Um, this is now registered on uh, the uh, Australian New Zealand clinical trials registry. So you're more than welcome to go and have a look at the details of the study in full. I thought I'd just quickly go through um, the protocol for this study um, as we have it. So basically um, using full dose of methadone, so X milligrams being whatever the patient dose, whatever the patient's dose is. And then day six, we have it, day seven, we go to a quarter. And that um, on, uh, on the buprenorphine dosing, we start at a 0.2 twice a day. So we give the patient actually one to take home for the evening. Similarly, day two, come in and dose, but take one home in the evening. And then it's a once daily, two, four, eight, 16. Day seven is flexible um, in that you can even uh, start patients onto the, and, and it's actually worked out reasonably well for many patients that actually want to start on the, the 32 milligram uh, weekly injection. And that's a good opportunity to then get them to come back in a couple of days to see us and to get another, uh, to get another jab done. So, and it just works out well with all this, the data we're collecting around them and just the timing as well. Um, we've been starting them on a, on a Thursday that sounds a bit crazy, but um, basically it means that you've got staff around to give the takeaways. Uh, the weekend, the, the first four days have been relatively seamless in most of the patients we do. It's sort of around day, you know, day five, day six, the patients do start to get some withdrawal symptoms. So just to give you some a little snippet of insight into how the study is going, um, the, this, is, this is not up to date, actually. There's probably another five in the microdosing arm um, since I've Put these slides together so but nonetheless um I, I haven't updated this but there hasn't been any more failures that i'm aware of um so 25 out of 30 have been successful which is really pleasing um but it's somewhat comparable to to other techniques um the highest we've done so far is 140 um and yeah the average dose is around 90 milligrams so and and really the those patients that are on the 80 or 100 it, it, it almost does feel like a bit of a sweet spot um, for, for sort of switching people over. A lot of patients can get down to around 100, um, but they're, they're a bit anxious about going any further. So it's kind of a nice way to transition them over. And 13 of them have been done as an outpatient, which is also good that we, we don't necessarily have to bring patients into hospital for prolonged treatments to do this as well. We are, it, as I say, it's a two, it's a two arm study so patients actually have the choice if they want to just do a standard of care transfer they can the majority of patients haven't chosen that um, and six of the, sorry, eight of them have done that with six of them being successful but most of them are on a smaller dose they most of the time they, they they want to do this because they want to do it quickly and and and, and so forth so just to give you some idea so as you can see on this um this chart um the sows and cows. So sows, I should point out, this is the short opioid withdrawal score. So we, knowing that we were going to be doing this as in our patients, we um, didn't. We, we thought it'd be too impractical to get patients to come back an hour after dosing to do cereal cows and all of that sort of thing because, well, firstly, I'm not paying them anything, <laughs> so they're not incentivized to return. But um, you know, getting people to come back an hour or so afterwards is tricky at the best of time, let alone in, in, in our cohort of, of clients. So we do this short opioid withdrawal score, which is a marker of withdrawal scores you know, of, 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 of symptoms and, um, in the last 24 hours. I think it's interesting that, that the, you'll note that the SALS, the short opioid withdrawal score, goes down uh, on the first two days, um, perhaps implying that there's a bit of anxiety um, behind this, which is understandable. Patients are a bit nervous. Um, they, you know, they, they may have had a bad experience with you before, but I just did think that that was funny that the, the, the average sales goes down in the first after the first couple of days. So maybe a small dose of buprenorphine is uh, therapeutic for um, uh, anxiety around switching over. Nonetheless, um, patients then do start to um, experience a little bit more in the way of subjective and, and, um, and um, withdrawal feelings. But overall, I mean, a cows of, of 
and our average cows of five to six is, is very low. Um, you know, that would be mild withdrawal. And, and basically to give you some idea of the sow scoring, because people might not be as familiar with it, if you were to score one or mild on everything, you'd score a 10. So, you know, the on average patients are experiencing um, you know, mild, um, you know, at the bottom end of mild withdrawal, which is, which is pleasing as well. So I think the highest we've had from a sow's um, was 23, which would be moderate. And then, as I said, this, the, their symptoms have, have sort of returned back to baseline by the time we see them at the, at the week, uh, the, the four week follow up. Um, so, look, just I guess some take home messages out of that or out of all of that. Um, and I'm happy to go over any of the things that, that I've talked about if it's not clear. Look, the pharmacology of, of methadone to buprenorphine transfers is. Is complicated there's no doubt about it um they're, they're, they're complicated medications and i think anything we can do to try and make that process a bit more streamlined and 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 easy um and something that's consistent as well is probably going to be good for the patient experience because their patients often have had bad experiences and it's interesting that you do still occasionally get patients coming in doing sort of high dose transfers where they're just stopping and starting without a lot of support in place and those sorts of things. So, um, you know, it's, it, they are still things that are, that are tricky and need a bit of planning, um, but um, it, it's certainly, um, you know, on the whole, they still are successful. So still 70 to 80% are successful. Perhaps there's a little bit of bias in the studies that are done in that they've got the supports around that can help people through those study, uh, through those transfers. Um, you know, research nurses or there's a bit of funding for extra, you know, they're getting extra medications or whatever else. So perhaps those numbers are a bit skewed. Um, but nonetheless, we still have a lot of options that are coming out now. Um, and we obviously can't recommend any one over the other. Um, but as I say, you know, it's about talking to the patient and sort of walking them through those options and seeing what they'd like to do. Um, I still encourage patients to get on a therapeutic dose of methadone. So I'm not I'm not big on sort of switching patients who are unstable on their methadone dose if they, they need to, you know, where possible, I want to try and get them on a therapeutic dose of methadone, um, get them stable for a little while and then do that. And I think having a good bridge to buprenorphine will be another incentive for patients to get onto a good dose of methadone. And I don't think we should be scared of them. I think we need to, you know, in patients who've been on methadone for a long time, we need to, you know, if, you know, we don't need to badger patients into being on buprenorphine, um, but I think it's certainly a discussion worth having with patients who've been stable for a while and you know, even a week's, you know, a lot of patients that want to transfer are even the ones who are on a week's worth of pickups um, that, I've, that I've been doing. You know, they're, on, they're, they're picking up their methadone once a week and yet even in spite of that, they still want to get over the sort of buprenorphine. Um, there are side effects associated with methadone like weight gain and, and so forth and perhaps that might be a reason. Um, but just um, you know, the convenience and the stigma and not having to pick up um, some incentives as well. Um, so I might, um, I might pause there um, and um, I'll have a look at the, the questions here. I see Craig has asked, do you have a maximum dose of methadone that you might do a transfer? I believe we've done at least one from 150. Um, I, I haven't, in my, in my protocol, I haven't, for the study, um, I haven't given a maximum. Um, I have certainly worked with a couple of people to come down with it. So perhaps I am skewing the numbers myself um, in that I've, um, I've asked a couple of people, but, asked, but I've just, you know, in patients who've got a bit of time and feel comfortable coming down a bit, I have come down. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm not, I'm always happy to give a go. At anything, probably probably 150. I feel like is about the mental ceiling of probably where I would go. Um, you know, at, at getting beyond that, it's pretty high dose. And then also you have to wonder, um, you know, how they're going to manage if they do swap. Certainly, most of the patients I've got are over 150 kind of need to be on more than 150 because they were still using when they're on, you know, 150 or so. So I think. Um, I think 150 is probably about my mental ceiling, but I'm, I'm interested to hear other people's thoughts on that as well. Um, and Ber uh, uh, Lucy's told me that, that it's Bernie's mountain dog. I'm sorry, not a mountain terrier um, for those of you who uh, were playing along at home. Um, 
Are there any other questions? Um, it might be a good opportunity to open the floor and let other people have a chat. And um, you're probably sick of hearing my dull nasal tones coming through here. Um, we can also talk a little bit about um, microdosing a little bit further for anybody, particularly the clinicians out there who might have some questions. Um, Anonymous has written, can a GP attempt methadone to suboxone transfer? Uh, they, they sure can, yeah. So that, that's a great question. Um, um, if, um, so, so no, there's no issue. Um, I, one thing I didn't mention in there that is a bit of a pain as well is you've got to do the, the paperwork for the pharmaceutical regulatory unit. So you do need um, another, so, and this is where it can get a bit messy. I've certainly had patients who, you know, we plan it all. Um, they'll, you know, I'll say, all right, do your last, and this is a you know, standard of care to stop and start. So they'll have their last dose of methadone on a Saturday. They skip their Sunday dose. They come and see me Monday. And then they say, oh, doc, actually, I've changed my mind. I want to get back on the methadone. And, and in some cases, I've done all the paperwork. <laughs> um, so they've, I've exited them from their methadone and they're on the view. So then I've got to re quickly redo the, the, the authorities and everything else, which is a slight um, hassle. Um, so, but that's not to say that GPs can't, it's just a bit time consuming and look, a lot of GPs perhaps don't have the, the time where we're all capacity and it's just nice to have that support around if you're going to do it in an ambulatory setting. Um, and, and look, that again, this might be, you know, a, a case to trial one of the other methods, whether that's bridging or whether that's microdosing or whatever else. Uh, what I will say about the methadone, um, the, the microdosing transfers is that, um, uh, and I don't, I, I don't know what happened outside of the study. Within the study, I spoke to the pharmaceutical regulatory unit to get, author, um, to get um, allowance to dual prescribe. So that they let me have a concurrent methadone of um, authorities so that I can give, I can prescribe both at the same time. Um, I don't know, I have never actually asked them if that extends beyond um, the, um, the, the trial. I certainly know there are clinicians out there who've done it though, so whether or not, I'm not, I'm, and I don't know whether they're doing that, you know, with a dual authority or just kind of doing it and sort of, yeah. Write scripts, ask questions later, so to speak. Um, but, um, but certainly GPs can attempt them. They may not feel comfortable doing it. Um, you have a client who's reduced down to 22 milligrams. He's uncertain whether to transfer over to buprenorphine or just go off the program altogether. So he's previously seen treatment and relapse. Look, th th this is a great, you know, another question about um, what is the best way to, to come off opioid treatment programs. There's no right answer around that. Um, you know, no one's done the, the definitive study on that. Um, it's certainly a high risk time when patients come off opioid treatments. It's probably the most high risk time. Um, for patients and um, perhaps coming over to Bupe with the, with the injectables means that if they get a few injections on board, they're going to have a very slow transition off. And so therefore um, that might be a good way to do it. And you know, perhaps the convenience of it, if they're just coming once a month, they may just decide to stay on it anyway. Um, so, you know, if, if the patient's on, um, is it, uh, I maybe just clarify in the chat here if that's 22 mils or milligrams. I'm guessing it's 22 milligrams because they've, they've come, they've reduced down quite a lot. Um, but um, I mean, at 22 milligrams, certainly, um, you know, be an easy one to transfer over to the, you know, as I say, you can even now just stop it and start the Bubadel if they want to. But my personal experience with that hasn't been particularly great. Um, then Nadine has also, um, can DASIS provide advice to clinicians considering methadone abuse? Um, I don't know. Um, I haven't been asked. I probably, I guess my, my advice would be that it is, it is time consuming. Um, so the clinicians got to be prepared for that. You probably, if you were a GP in a busy GP practice, you'd almost want to schedule them for an appointment each day to make sure you're reviewing them each day and giving them um, some, some time to do that. Um, I mean, they can be referred to a specialist centre to get that done. I think that, I mean, that as, our, as a specialist centre, I think that should be, um, should be our, 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 you know, part of our, our role. Um, I thank you, Anonymous, for clarifying that, yes, that was, that was milligrams per visit. Um, in what settings would you recommend outpatient 
microdosing in such a way that we're using street opioids or oxycodone heroin. Um, I've, I've done one um, for a patient who was on 60, um, who was still using heroin once a week or so. It's probably one of the messier ones, if I had to be honest. Um, she was really eager to get onto it. And I think it was more, I guess the, the setting is more, you know, patient resistance to going up further on methadone. You know, I still have that chat, you know, maybe you should get onto a better dose of methadone, you know, get up to a hundred milligrams and then think about doing this. But, you know, in terms of supporting the patient, I will often try anyway. She did get there. She she got onto it. She's she's on the injections. She 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 got to the four weeks. I don't know what happened after four weeks, but she got there. Um yeah and, and look I mean it's 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 tricky with um when they're still using and I think look I mean perhaps they might you know it's worth it some you know the, the argument is maybe it's worth a trial of buprenorphine because the methadone's not working for them but most of the time my experience has been they're probably just not on a big enough dose of methadone I mean most of the time they're on 40 or 60 or you know something that's not quite there so um Anonymous is, uh, you've got some great, well, not that the Dean's questions were not good too, but um, you, you keep uh, asking really pointed questions. You mentioned that Temgesic isn't PBS funded as OAT. Did I say that? Um, I don't remember saying that in this forum, but I've certainly mentioned it before. So yeah, this is a good opportunity, I guess, to mention um, that, the, that in my regimen, I'm using, as you saw, 0.2 mil. So if I go back, to the, the regimen of, that I got as part of my study, um, that this um, uses 0.2 milligrams BD on the first day. You're quite right. There's no sub, so I've been using subutex from day two onwards. I don't think we need the naloxone, particularly as they're picking it up each day. And I think it's just, you know, I appreciate the bioavailability of the naloxone is low, but I just think it's a confounder I don't want to, don't want to have. Um, and so on day one, um, we give them 0.2 BD. So you, you can split subutex, 400 micrograms. My understanding is it's messy and you're more likely to end up with 300 on one part and 100 in the other. So um, at that time, we, so when we were doing this study, we basically made the decision to use Temgesic. So you're quite right, Temgesic is not, um, it's not, it's not actually TGA approved for use in opioid treatment program, even though Temgesic is the exact, is buprenorphine, it's a brand name. Subutex, Temgesic, same, same active ingredient. You know, it's, it's like taking um, Nurofen versus, you know, chemist's own um, ibuprofen. It, it, it's the same active ingredient. Um, it's it's not funded you can i haven't done it outside of um my own trial so within the trial yes we have to pay for it i'm lucky enough to be surrounded by departments that allow me to spend spend money and don't chase me too hard up for it um i think it's about a dollar per to, to temg so it's not much um and so yes we've been paying for that for our patients and making it for them and preparing it in a nice neat little pack that they can you know, they can have their dose and have one later. If you were doing it without um, without the study, yes, they would they would have to pay for it. So I think, as I say, you just give them a, it's a private script and it, it would be a couple of bucks. It wouldn't be much. Um, I think that I've gotten through all the the questions. Um, any um sorry if anybody else has any questions that they just wanted to either put into the q a box or alternatively you can raise your hand if you wanted to um, speak to ask any questions i think it's interesting there's a dismissed questions why would i dismiss someone's question it's a bit rude um sorry you probably can't all see the little, little, little zoom boxes that i'm looking at right now But I look, I do, while you're busy writing questions, which I'm sure you're all doing, um, I, I think, um, you know, for our telehealth partners, I think 
um, getting people onto buprenorphine with the tyranny of distance as well um, will certainly be a benefit to, to some patients who might have to travel long distances. Even if they are only picking up once a week, they may have to drive an hour um, to go and pick it up. And this is, you know, granted it's going to be a pain in the bum for them for a week, um, but um, you know, after that, it's 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 you know, smooth sailing, um, assuming that goes well. No other questions, I don't think. Sorry, someone's just popped in there, um, just checking where we can okay. re-watch this. Um, so one of the NCRED staff, the, this is being recorded and it's going to be posted on the NCRED page link. So the original invitation uh, to these sessions where you can register on the promotional flyer, there's also a link underneath, which is where the um, videos will be uploaded for the recordings to watch them at a later date. I like you anonymous, whoever you are, you ask good questions and you want to rewatch my presentation. I'll, uh, I'll never, I'll never know who you are, but I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled you're here. Maybe it's my wife. She just got, got on here to butter me up. Um, yeah. um, I'm not your wife. <laughs> All right. Um, any other any other questions? Otherwise, I think it's uh, twenty five past three. Good timing. Um, I will mention as well because I'm sure Lucy will mention it as well that they there are three questions to fill in just to provide some feedback when you leave the session or we log off. So please, if you can, just. Yeah, take take your two seconds. You know, three questions um, uh, about the session, um, and um, also, uh, and it's a, it's anonymous, so we don't know who's written it. Um, and the if uh, just as a as a heads up, next week is Easter, and then the week after is Anzac Day. So that's back to back Mondays that are public holidays. Um, so our next session won't be until. The 9th of May. Is it the 9th of May? Yeah. There's no session on the 2nd? No, did that that might be the, is it the, that's not Anzac Day, is it? No, Anzac Day. I'll just have a check. Oh, no, sorry, there's one on the 2nd. Okay, beautiful. No, that's fine. So the next session will be the second of the second of May. Oh, that's Dr. Jeku Jacob is presenting then. Sorry, Jeku, if you're still on here, I said ninth, I meant second of May. Hope I think Jeku is online, so uh, hopefully, yes, he's fine with that. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. And sorry, I'll let sorry, I should let Lucy do the chairing. Lucy, did you want to sign off? That's all good. You've already said everything, Chris, just um, for people who have a chance just to fill in the, the questions that automatically come up at the end, just get some feedback. Thanks to everyone who attended today. Um, if anyone has any problems like finding um, the link to the NCRED page where the recordings are, then feel free to email myself or Chris um, and we can help you out. Uh, and we will see everybody in, I suppose, three weeks time, seeing as we have two weeks off. Um, thank you again, Chris, for presenting today. And thanks to everybody who asked questions as well. Um, we really appreciate it. All right, everybody can head off now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Antarctica, we can probably stop the recording now and um, leave the session. That should be fine. <laughs>